Hello my dear colleagues. Today I would like to present you my lecture. The topic of the lecture is benign diseases of rectum. During today's lecture we'll discuss several major problems concerning the topic. First of all the hemorrhoids, the rectal fissures, the anal polyps, acute and chronic parapoptitis or in other words the rectal fistulas. So first we'll talk about the hemorrhoids. If you translate this name from Greek, ancient Greek language, it would sound like bleeding. This is so because the main symptom, the main sign of hemorrhoids is of course the rectal bleeding. For you to know that bleeding is a special condition which is which might be present during different kinds of diseases. Now if you speak about the hemorrhoids, a special thing about the bleeding is that it always appears after the toilet, after the defecation, this is the first important differential sign, and the second one, the blood, is almost always has a bright red color. So this is things these are the things which are special for the bleeding in case of the hemorrhoids. Now on this picture you can see the several kinds of hemorrhoids, actually these are the third and fourth stages of the hemorrhoid or the results of the previous complicated hemorrhoids like this picture, the results of the previous thrombosis of the hemorrhoids or the bleeding from the hemorrhoidal nodes. Now if we speak about the etiology and the pathogenesis of the hemorrhoids, I have to admit that there is no, there is no one exact reason for the development of the hemorrhoids Usually this is a combination of several reasons and uh, the mechanism out of all of these reasons is always always the same. So from one hand we have the uh, increased blood supply to the hemorrhoidal nodes, increased uh, blood flow in this area which might be the result of the constipation, of the hard work and hard efforts, for example, or the natural delivery at women. From the other hand, if the blood supply, blood flow is normal, but the blood outflow is disturbed, this can happen in case of the sitting work, such as the office workers or the drivers, for example, or the other condition is the pregnancy. In both of these cases we have the low blood circulation in this area, so the blood outflow is disturbed, is violated. For example, if we speak about the pregnancy, when the fetus grows, it's, it becomes increased in sizes and thus it presses upon the uh, vessels and especially on the veins, which take the blood from the hemorrhoidal plexus. Thus, this blood remains in the small pelvis and especially in the area of hemorrhoids, leading to the development of the disease. On this picture you can see the structure, the anatomical structure of the rectum and anal area. So here you can see the internal sphincter, the one that we cannot control with our mind, the external sphincter, the one that we can control with our mind. Now the internal hemorrhoidal node and the external hemorrhoidal node. You see the difference, first of all, in the location, and the second of all, is that the internal nodes are covered with mucose, the mucose layer of the rectum. Now the external are covered with the skin, with the perianal skin. The other name for that skin is anoderm. And the border between the internal and the external nodes is a location, is a place which is called the pectinate line. <coughs> the other picture, once again, you can notice the external sphincter, the one that we can control, the internal, which we cannot control with our mind, and the increased hemorrhoidal tissue of the internal nodes and of the external nodes. The classification. We classify hemorrhoids by the etiological sites 
and they're divided into the initiate and acquired or the primary and the secondary hemorrhoid by the localization this might be the internal submucosal the external and the mixed or the combined hemorrhoids but the clinical course of course we divide them into chronic and acute and if we speak about the chronic this might be the non-complicated and complicated hemorrhoids. Now speaking about the complications, most of them are the thrombosis, the bleeding or the strangulation. Also we define primary and secondary hemorrhoids and this is very important because there are different tactics of treatment in both of these kinds of hemorrhoids. If we speak about the secondary hemorrhoids, this means that it's not an independent disease but a result of the well, some kind of a primary disease, for example, this might be the liver cirrhosis, the disorders of the circulatory system, or different kinds of tumors. Another schematic picture of hemorrhoids, you see the internal hemorrhoidal node and the external one. Both of them have a different blood supply. Now we speak about the chronic hemorrhoid. It is usually divided into four main stages. So the first picture is a normal hemorrhoid. You see the hemorrhoidal plexus, the, speaking about the internal nodes, of course, inside the rectum, upper the pectinate line, they are not increased. This is considered to be normal. Now, if we speak about the stage one of hemorrhoids, the internal nodes are slight, lightly increased. They do not leave the anal channel and in remain inside the rectum. Actually, the stages of hemorrhoids, of the chronic hemorrhoids, are always classified by the size, by the increasing of the internal nodes. So once again, the stage one, the nodes remain inside the anal channel, they do not leave it anyway, and uh, most of the people have no idea about the having of hemorrhoids, and they found out that they do have the hemorrhoid, when they come to proctologists due to some other kinds of diseases and complaints not connected to the hemorrhoids and during this examination the proctologist might put the diagnosis of hemorrhoids of the first stage also or the other kind when the people find out about the hemorrhoids of the first stage in this are the rare cases of the complications such as thrombosis or bleeding I have to admit that the stage 1 of hemorrhoids is present in the vast majority of adults of the developed countries due to the lifestyle and due to the disturbed diet, the wrong diet. Stage 2 hemorrhoids. The nodes are increased, they always remain inside and they leave the anal channel and go outside, they prolapse actually, during the defecation or during the hard work, during lifting of hard weights and then they come back inside without any additional assistance. On the stage 3 of hemorrhoids, the internal nodes are increased, they leave the anal channel, they prolapse, after the defecation, after the hard work, after the lifting weights, or even after coughing or sneezing, and they do not come back inside on their own, so the patient needs to use the hand assistance, to fix them back into the anal channel. And the stage 4 of hemorrhoids, they prolapse out of the anal channel and they never come back inside, even, even using the hand assistance. So we use this classification to define the correct way of treatment. Now if we speak about the variants of clinical course and complications, so the initial parts of hemorrhoids is characterized by the gradual beginning and low reflectal clinical signs, such as presence of hemorrhoid nodes. Durations of this period might be different from several months to years. Chronic course of the hemorrhoids is characterized by the periodical acute conditions and remissions. The difference of clinical course of hemorrhoids is only in complications. Bleeding from the hemorrhoids appears mostly during or after the defecation and may be as profuse as moderate. Blood is always bright, bright red blood, speaking about the, uh, giving the idea that we speak about the 
arterial blood. Now the acute thrombosis of the hemorrhoid nose is mostly see seen in the third stage of the hemorrhoids, though it might be present even in the second stage. Thrombosis is a complication of both internal and external nose, but usually it's more present, more often present for the, uh, the external nose. So during the thrombosis appears the edema of the bluish color, color and the severe pain. The progressive disease course sometimes may be conditioned by thrombosis of the inferior vena cava. Such complications as prolapse and strangulation in anal sphincter of the internal hemorrhoidal nodes appear not that often. Nodes swell usually, they become bluish, sometimes they occur, uh, the necrosis occurs which might spread to the area of the external nodes. The edema of the anal region spreads up to 10 centimeters. Now in this picture you can see the condition of the fourth stage hemorrhoids. You see the prolapse of the internal nodes and the greatly increased internal nodes, external nodes. So the diagnostic program. First of all, we have to collect the anamnesis and physical data, do the examination of the anal region using the finger investigation of rectum, of course, the investigation of rectum by the rectal mirror, the rectoscopy, general blood count, general urine test, coagulogram, and sedimentation reactions. So first of all, speaking about the anamnesis, during the anamnesis we have to collect first of all the complaints of the patient. Usually they complain on pain, on the feeling of discomfort, itching and burning in the anal area, which usually become stronger and harder after the defecation. The next com complaint usually is the bleeding, so in this case patients would mostly complain that they bleed during or after the defecation with a bright red blood. The, de the disease usually develops slowly, it takes a, a chronic duration and it takes a year, years when it develops from the light stage, from the primary initial stage to the more, to the third or fourth stage of the disease. Usually these patients complain and during the collect collecting of the anamnesis, they don't is they notice that they are uh, that they are more likely to have constipation than diarrhea. First of all, next you have to ask them about the conditions of work. Either it's a sitting work like office workers or drivers, or it's a hard physical work, or do they train sports or something. Now the, exter the examination of the anal region, so first during the eye examination you would probably have to note the increased external nodes and to check if the, there is a prolapse of the internal nodes or if it's not present. The finger investigation of rectum helps to define, to palpate the internal nodes, to define and discover if there is thrombosis of external or sometimes the internal nodes to find the traits of blood inside and also to find if there is no tumors or other formations in the lower ampullar part of rectum. This is the primary stage before using the different kinds of instrumental in examination. First of all beginning from the examination of rectal rectum by the rectal mirror and the rectoscopy. So during the examination with the rectal mirror you will notice the internal part of the anal channel, the way it looks like, its texture and structure, the presence or absence of blood and the presence or absence of tumor formation. And the next stage is the rectoscopy, the instrumental investigation, the instrumental examination of rectum using the rectoscope, a special metal tube to observe the internal surface of rectum. This examination is needed to be performed 
especially in that cases when the patient complain about bleeding, to do the differential diagnosis with the rectal cancer or with the polyps or different kinds of inflammations of rectum and uh, colon. The other tests like blood and urine tests are typical for any kind of surgical patients, nothing special about that, the usual diagnostic program. Speaking about the differential diagnosis, first of all we have to do the differential diagnosis with the anal fissure. In the time when anal fissure is characterized by the severe pain during or after the defecation, the spasm of sphincter and the small bleeding during the defecation. Now if we speak about the hemorrhoid, the pain is not that severe, it takes more chronic character, but the bleeding is more expressed in case of the hemorrhoid than in case of anal fissure. The cancer of rectum or different kinds of benign diseases, benign formation uh, of rectum, so these are usually painless, they do not hurt. But now if you speak about the bleeding, so usually the bleeding goes before the defecation or in time of the defecation and the color of blood, if we speak about the hemorrhoids, so usually the blood appears after the defecation and is bright red blood. So in case of tumors and tumor formation of the middle and upper, upper ampullar parts of rectum, the blood might not be that bright, it might be darker due to the hemolysis because it takes some time for blood to when, when blood remains inside the rectum in case of the rectal cancer. <coughs> Same story about the polyps. Usually these are painless and they are followed with blood only in case of the traumatization of polyps. Normally if it's not ruptured the blood is not present. tactics and choice of treatment of hemorrhoids. As I mentioned before, there are four stages of the chronic hemorrhoids. So usually we do not use, and we have this classification, to choose the optimal way of medical treatment of, treatment of hemorrhoids on the different stages. Now, if we speak about the stage one hemorrhoids, usually it does not require to be treated surgically and most of all, in most of the cases, all we have to do is just to teach your patient to change his lifestyle. For example, if the patient has a sitting work, so you would recommend your patient to move more, to make like sport breaks for during five minutes on every hour, for example. If the patient has a hard work, you have to recommend your patient to lower the weights needed to be lifted. A special thing is about the diet, so always you have to recommend your patient the fiber diet so to prevent the constipations, to normalize the stool so that in some cases you might often you might even recommend the stool softeners so that the defecation would be soft and light not painful and would not demand any pressure and any additional efforts for the patient. Very important thing is to keep the strict diet and the strict lifestyle to prevent the hemorrhoids in the first stage. Now if we speak about the second stage of hemorrhoids, I will remind the stage two when the hemorrhoids leave the anal channel after the hard working or after the defecation and then they come back inside without any additional uh, assistance. In this case, except for the mentioned diet and changing the lifestyle, we would begin the, con to tr the treatment with a conservative treatment, with the conservative medications, different kinds of unguents, uh, the warm buses and pain releasing medications. And in stage 2 we also begin using the minimally invasive methods, for example, the latex ligation of the hemorrhoid of the internal hemorrhoidal nodes or different kinds of 
influencing upon the external and internal nodes, for example, the surgitron procedure uh, or the ligature scalpel or the harmonic scalpel to remove the increased hemorrhoidal tissue. And the very best condition in stage 2 of hemorrhoids, the very best uh, surgical uh, medical treatment, is of course the hemorrhoidal desarterization, a special procedure which demands the ultrasound sonography during this procedure, a special ultrasound, duplex ultrasound scanner is inserted into the rectum. During this procedure, the scanner helps to the surgeon to find the vessel, the exact vessel which, go, which goes to the hemorrhoidal nodes, to stitch it, and thus we stop the blood supply to the hemorrhoidal nodes. And this might be considered as a genetic treatment of hemorrhoids, not symptomatic, for example, at the latex ligation when we just remove the increased hemorrhoidal tissue without removing the main reason. Beginning from the st stage 3, all the minimally invasive methods are not that useful, they do not give the good results, so the only one is still the uh, hem transanal hemorrhoidal desarterization and the stage 3 is actually the condition when we usually begin the surgical treatment and the classical operation for this case is the Milligan-Morgan procedure which is al also used in the stage 4 of hemorrhoids where there are no any other possibility to treat your patient except for the surgery. On this picture you can notice the stage 3 up to stage 4 hemorrhoids increased in the typical places. Usually we use the uh, localization of 11 o'clock, 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock if you would com compare it with your hand watch. So during the Milligan-Morgan procedure, during the Milligan-Morgan hemorrhoidectomy, Usually this procedure is made either by on, uh, with a general anesthesia or sometimes in the local anesthesia. This procedure demands the hospitalization. During this procedure we dissect both external and internal nodes. We stitch the supplying vessel in each node. We stitch it and then you remove the nodes. The last stage of the surgery is the stitching the layer stitching of the bound to prevent the further infication of the anal and rectal area. Usually we use three places for this procedure 11 o'clock, 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock so these all nodes are removed. On this picture you can notice the removing of the hemorrhoidal nodes on 3 o'clock you see it's pulled outside and removed in this exact picture this is the removing, remo removing of the external hemorrhoidal node now the next topic of our today's lecture the next stage is the discussion of the rectal fissures rectal fissures are the linear or triangle shaped defects of the anal mucose this disease takes the third place after the hemorrhoids and periproctized by its frequency if we speak about the proctological diseases. You can notice the, picture, the fissure in this picture. You see in this exact case it has like a square form. This is a schematic picture of the anal fissure. So usually it's located on the margin when the anoderm turns to the mucose. I have to admit that this is a very painful disease and it causes lots of trouble for the patient. The etiology and pathogenesis. Uh, the anal fissure has always has a mechanical factor on its pathogenesis. pathogenesis. So mostly, actually it's considered there are two main theories, the mechanical theory and the infectious theory infectious theory, but my, on my personal opinion, usually this is a combination of these both
factors. So, if we speak about the mechanical factor, uh, the previous to the development of fissure would always be present the constipation in your patient. And when the stool is hard and the patient has to make a hard effort, a strong effort to go to the toilet, thus it, he stretches his mucose in the anal area and the ruptures appear which will turn to the anal fissures. At the same time the feces are always infected that the infection from the feces will join the ruptured mucose and cause the inflammation in this area which will make the patient's com complaints harder. So the pain will increase, it will be much stronger the feeling of itching and burning in this area will always accompany the defecation. Now here you can see the location, usual localization. So we speak about the anus and thus in this place we have the anal fissure. So it always accompanies both, almost always it involves both mucose and skin on the anal channel. To classify the anal fissures, we have to remember that on the clinical core they are divided into acute and chronic. At the same time, they might be complicated by the periproctitis, malignancy, the bleeding, the pectinosis, and combined with other diseases such as hemorrhoids, proctitis, or polyps. So, if we speak about the duration of the disease, usually they are divided into acute and chronic. The acute fissure, usually the disease lasts up to one month. It's always painful, especially after the defecation. It might be accompanied by the bleeding. And in most of the cases, if the patient comes in time, you can manage to treat him conservatively. But when the time goes, when the time flies, and the patient is not admitted, is not treated, or not treated, or he is treated but not correctly, or he's in this rare cases when his organism does not give the needed response for the treatment, it might turn to the chronic. In this case, the margins of acute fistula, uh, acute fissure will turn to the scar tissue and thus the fistula, the fissure would be called chronic instead of acute. So the difference is that in this case it's a fresh rupture within and the margins are made of mucose or the skin tissue. Now in this case this we speak about the scar tissue and these fissures almost never can be treated conservatively. Besides, very often in case of the chronic anal fissure, it is accompanied by special structures which are called the sentinel piles. These are the special formation in the anal channel. In case of the anal fissure, these would grow in its uh, sizes, become bigger, actually to cover the area of fissure to make the defecation, to make the process less painful. So the main symptom of anal fissures is the pain, of course, which is especially obvious after the defecation. In some cases it takes from several minutes up to even one or two or even three hours when the pain goes down. And in most of the cases the patient would need to take some pain releasing medications to lower the pain in, this, in his anal area. In some chronic conditions, the patients are even afraid to go to the toilet because they know that the process, the procedure would be painful. So they prevent the defecation for two or three or four days. Now when the time actually comes to go to the toilet, it takes, makes even a harder effort for the patient to go to the toilet. Thus they feel a very strong and severe pain. This also might be accompanied by the bleeding when we have the fresh ruptures of the fish of the anal fissure. <coughs> mm.
variants of clinical course and complications. Acute fissures characterized by acute onset, the presence of anal area of uh, long bound with soft bottom and its leg length is usually 1 to 2 centimeters and it's about 0.3 up to 0.5 centimeters wide and the depth is up to 0.3 centimeters. The disease might have the duration up to two months. As a rule, the acute fissures do not cause the major complications. The chronic fissures may disturb patients from two months, from actually from one month and up to one year and more until they're operated. The diagnostic program. Once again, collecting of the anamnesis and the physical data. As I mentioned before, the main complaint is the pain, which is which becomes stronger, especially after the defecation, and might last up to one, two, or three hours after the defecation. The finger examination, the eye and the finger examination. So on the eye examination, in most of the cases, you can notice the fissure. During the finger examination, the patient will definitely complain on the pain and he will point you on the place where his annual fissure is located. Same story about the investigation with the rectal mirrors. Still, this would be painful, but this will give you the, the possibility to see the rectal fissure. The rectoscopy is made for the differential diagnosis mostly. The fissure, for example, is complicated by bleeding, so we use rectoscopy to make the differential diagnosis with hemorrhoids or with the tumor formation, either malignant or benign, in the rectum. But the rectoscopy is contraindicated in case of the pectinosis. This is a condition, a special condition, which follows the chronic anal fissures. So this leads to the narrowing of the anal channel by the scar tissue. In this case, the rectoscopy is contraindicated. The blood and urine tests are usual for any kind of the surgical patient. Now you can see the picture of anal fissures. This is a condition of the chronic anal fissure in the phase of coming down and in the phase in the acute phase when it hurts more. So this, if we speak about the chronic anal fissure, it might heal, the bound here might heal and then appear once again after, this, after the defecation when the patient comes to go to the toilet harder than usually so the rupture appears again and that's the way it looks like. The differential diagnosis of anal fissures usually we perform it with proctal gear a special disease when the patient feels pain in his rectum. The pain in case of proctal gear is usually localized in the area of rectum. Now we speak about the anal fissures. The pain is localized in the anal channel on the exit from the rectum actually. Besides, usually the proctal gear is present and the psychiatric patient or the neurological patient with neurosis or the history. So this is some kind of the manifestation of this other mental disorders. Now the next disease is the anal form of the non-specific ulcerous colitis, which is also characterized by the bleeding during the rectal examination and the rectoscopy. We will notice the hyperemia and the edema of mucos and the development and appearing of ulcers and erosions in the rectum. So this is the symptoms of unspecific ulcerous colitis, which are not present in case of the anal fissures. The Crohn's disease has a pretty similar duration, clinical duration to the uh, ulcerative colitis, though in case uh, of the rectal examination and the rectoscopy will notice the ulcers which do not spread that much and they mostly are like 
fissures that penetrate into all depths of intestinal wall. Now, in case of the histological investigation during the Crohn's disease, we'll find the revealed granuloma, the cancer of rectum, a very dangerous disease, which is frequently, author, uh, frequently followed by the bleeding. As I mentioned before, the middle and upper ampullary parts of rectum, uh, if they are complicated with bleeding, the blood would not be that bright as the bleeding in case of hemorrhoids or the rectal fissure. Besides, usually the, pain, the cancer is not painful. And of course, the histological examination will always help to, to put the correct diagnosis in this case. In this picture, you can notice the combination of two diseases, the hemorrhoids and the anal fissure. And actually, about 30% of hemorrhoids of the third and fourth stage are accompanied by the anal fissures. The tactics of treatment. So the acute fissures are almost always treated conservative, conservatively using the local treatment such as unguents and suppositories and uh, warm buses, baths and uh, a special diet, low fiber diet for the patients to prevent the constipation. In case of the chronic anal fissures most of them cannot be treated conservatively and thus you will need to operate your patient using to remove your, the anal fissure using the scalpel. Indications for the surgical treatment are the chronic ulcer complicated by the pectinosis, the fistula, the bleeding and those who cannot be treated effectively by the conservative treatment. If you speak about the radical methods uh, which are recommended to treat the anal fissure, of course, the main one is an operation, the surgical removing of the uh, anal fissure with the cutting off the scar tissue margins of the, uh, of the anal fissure and then the stitching the defect of mucosa back together. There are different kinds of surgical procedures we will not stop on them more exactly that depends on each exact case and on the anatomy of the anal channel the polyps of colon and rectum the polyp is a non-malignant tumors uh, of different localizations today we speak about the anal channel and the rectum in most of the cases they have the special tract structures which are called the legs and usually they grow, grow from the mucosa. So you can see the schematic picture of anal polyp, of rectal polyp, so this area is called the leg and the polyp itself. The etiology and pathogenesis. The reasons of polyps, polyps appears mostly are the disorders of the embryonal development, the inflammatory processes of mucosa and also the viral infection but still the exact reason is not estimated. You have always to distinguish the rectal polyps, the anal polyps, with the hemorrhoids. Usually it's not that hard to, to do because during the palpation the polyp is usually more firm and it has about the same color as the normal tissues of that area, either the skin or the mucose, while the hemorrhoids, uh, if we speak about the internal hemorrhoids, usually they are bluish. Now the external hemorrhoids also have the bluish color, even if they are covered with skin. The classification by the etiology we can define the initiate and acquired due to an inflammatory processes. While the process spreading these are the single, multiple and total. By the external appearance and microscopic structure these are the true, the natural polyps like glandular, fleecy polyps or the fake polyps such as the hypertrophic the polyps, the pseudo polyps in case of the ulcerative colitis. The symptoms. Usually, 
the men usually suffer more than women. Uh, usually they do not give any pain symptoms of their presence. Uh, mostly we find out about if they're localized externally, so the patient might even notice the polyp if it's an, an anal localization if we speak about the rectal localization does not give the bright clinic only in those cases when they are complicated with bleeding. So the 100% method of diagnosis is the rectoscopy of course or the colonoscopy with the biopsy and the further histological examination. On this picture you can see the middle ampullar part of rectum with the two polyps. The small polyp on the side and the bigger one, actually this is not a polyp itself, this is a, another kind of benign tumor which is called the veliferous tumor which grows always from the mucose there. Both of these conditions are not malignant but both of these are the pre-corresponding factors for the development of cancer. This is why the polyps are always the indication for the operative treatment, either the endoscopic or the open surgery. Speaking about the polyposis, so the condition when there are more than 10 polyps, usually they spread all over the large intestine, all over the colon. It has, except for the internal signs, which can be noticed during the colonoscopy, in some rare cases it has even the external manifestations, such as pigment spots, for example, which usually localize on the fingers, on the face and lips, and on the mucosal membranes of cheeks, for example. Also, the polyps of the colon are frequently accompanied by the polyps of the other localization in the GIT, mostly these are the stomach polyps. Diagnostic programs. The anamnesis and the physical data, the finger investigation of rectum, the rectal mirror investigation, rectoscopy, irigography, the fibrocolonoscopy, and usual blood, general blood counts and general urine tests and all usual surgical examinations, general surgical examinations. Now you can see the anoscopy and the lower ampulla, the polyp of the lower ampulla part of rectum. As I mentioned before, the treatment of uh, polyps is always operative. Actually, when, the when it's a single, single polyp up to 5 millimeters of, in its size, you can observe it for and to repeat the colonoscopy or the rectoscopy every three months during the next year to, this, to see if it grows or not. If it becomes bigger than 5 mm, this is an indication for the surgical treatment for the removing of the polyp. Now this picture is a very rare condition, the rectal prolapse, actually these are the two pathologies in one time, the rectal prolapse and the rectal polyp. You see the lack of polyp this is the place where the supplying vessel is localized. This is why there is a, some kind of danger during the removing of pollen. So it always demands a special staple or the ligation you know, in, this, in this area. Excuse me. Now the acute paraproctitis is an acute inflammatory disease which is characterized by the inflammation of the pararactal cellular tissue, of the pararactal fat tissue, and it occupies about 30% of all diseases of rectum, and actually it takes the second place after the hemorrhoid by its spreading. There is a picture of paraproctitis. It has a usual signs of the inflammation as any, the signs of inflammation of any other organ. Tumor, redness, 
high body temperature, severe pain, and the violation of function. The etiology. It always has an infectious factor on its development, so usually there is a special defect in the anal channel. Usually this is a defect of the anal crypt, or in some rare cases this might be the result of the anal fissure, for example, or the other diseases, chronic inflammatory diseases such as Crohn's disease or the ulcerative colitis. So in this case, when the rupture of mucus of the anal channel appears, the infection gets from the feces, which are always infected, to the perirectal fat tissue. It becomes inflamed, the inflammation turns to the pus. This disease is very painful, it has a very bright clinic. Usually the patients do not remain at home more than one or two days after the onset of the uh, disease. It always has a sharp, acute onset with a bright clinic and most of these patients come to the hospital in time because the pain causes great suffering for the patients. Besides, the high body temperature is also accompanied, is also accompanying this disease. The high body temperature is 37.5 up to 39 degrees centigrade. Morphologically, there is defined purulent inflammation of crypts with further spreading of uh, to perorectal, ischiorectal, and pelvis cellular tissue. Purulent inflammation usually is as flag bone or rarely as an abscess. During, due to the localization of the abscess, you can define several kinds of periproctitis. The intrasphincteric abscess located between the uh, tissues of internal and external sphincters, the ischiorectal abscess, the most ty typical kind of uh, periproctitis, the perianal abscess, and the one which is not pictured here, the pelvioorectal abscess, which is located in the upper parts, upper sides of the rectum. So by the etiology we define usual, anaerobic, like gangrenous, uh, or anaerobic lymphangi lymphangitis, the sepsis. Then the specifics such as tuberculosis or the syphilitic periproctitis and the post-traumatic periproctitis. By the localization we define the submucosal, subcutaneous, ischiorectal, pelvioorectal and retrorectal periproctitis. Separately, there is, we define the secondary periproctitis, which actually is the in, uh, result of the inflammatory process of some other origin, and it might spread to perorectal stellar tissue from prostate gland, for example, or from female genitals. Now the other picture more exact picture, so here we can, you can notice once again the intersphincteric paraproctitis, the intersphincteric abscess, the perianal subskin subcutaneous abscess, the high intermuscular abscess, the ischiorectal, the most typical, and close by its clinic the retrorectal, which would be located on the posterior wall, behind the posterior wall of Rectum. Now the submucosal, when the pus is located just under the mucous layer of the rectum and the pelvioorectal, the pelvic rectal abscess. The periproctitis has both local and general symptoms. The most often this is pain in anal region or in the area of rectum, the swelling, the hyperemia, the fluctuation, the constipation, in some cases even the dysuria, the disturbances of the urination, the increase of body temperature and of course the loss of appetite and workability. During the general blood, ana blood analysis we will notice the leukocytosis with the left shift 
ESR increased and different other conditions which are less import important in this case. Another picture of acute periprotitis, so as I mentioned before, you see the anus here. Probably the reason of periprotitis was somewhere here in this area, this was a defect, the rupture of anal crypt and the infection from the feces got through the through this anal crypt, rupture of anal crypt to the periorectal fat tissue and caused a severe inflammation. So you can see the swelling, the swelling area with the hyperemia of this area, the redness. If you would palpate it, the patient would feel a strong pain. His body temperature would be about 38 degree and degrees centigrade and more, and of course the loss of function because the now speaking about the main function here is the defecation, so it would be really painful. Another severe complication of, of periproctitis, periproctitis itself is called the anaerobic periproctitis, and this exact case is the fle Fournier phlegmon. The Fournier is an ancient, is an old French scientist, French surgeon who discovered this disease, so you can see the spreading of the inflammation to the scrotum and to the neighboring tissues. It is very dangerous and it is very hard to be treated. The periproctitis always demands the surgical treatment, actually the urgent surgical treatment, after the small, the, the little and short preoperative prevention. So first, the collection of anamnesis and physical data, if we speak about the diagnostic program. The then examination of anal area and anal channel. The finger examination. The finger examination is always painful. We do not usually use the rectal mirror investigation or the rectoscopy due to the pain. Some additional methods like x-ray examination of the ischial areas the bacteriogram after the surgery, after we, we release the, pu the pus, and usual blood and urine tests such as general blood count and general urine test, the biochemical blood analysis, coagulogram and the sedimental reactions. The differential diagnosis. Usually we do the differential diagnosis with acute hemorrhoids uh, or the hemorrhoids complicated by the thrombosis. This Similar is the pain present in both diseases, but the difference is that the, usually in case of hemorrhoid, the body temperature is normal and the pain is lighter than if we speak about the acute periproctitis. The anal fissure. The swelling is slight, not that obvious as in case of the acute periproctitis, once again the body temperature is normal, though the pain is present and it becomes hotter and stronger after the defecation. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, the tactics of treatment is always the surgical treatment. Now the main thing, the, the main strategy in this case is divided into two parts. First of all, to release the pus, so to do the incision and release the pus, Thus, we remove the result, but to remove the main reason of the disease, we have to remove the anal crypt. So, the structured anal crypt, which led to the, the, to the spreading of infection from the lumen of rectum, from the feces, to the parietal cellular tissue. So, here you can notice, once again, the patient with an anaerobic periproctitis and we had to, this is a patient from our hospital, we had to do the several incisions to release the pus and in this area there was another incision to remove the anal crypt which caused the disease. If This is very important to remove the anal crypt because if you do not do this just to release the pus so the patient will definitely feel better there are some conditions when the pus is released on its own without any surgical assistance. This happens when the patient remains at home 
for longer time, like three to four to five days. After the releasing of puce, the patient feels way much better. The pain goes away, the body temperature becomes normal. But if you do not remove the anal crypt, the ruptured anal crypt, which was the reason for this disease, the patient will definitely have either the recurrence of the acute periproctitis in some closer future, or the acute periproctitis will turn to the chronic periproctitis, or the other name for that is rectal fistula. Rectal fistulas are the tubular purulent channels in the cellular tissue surrounding the rectum and anus. They are always the result of the previous untreated or treated incorrectly acute periproctitis or in some cases this might be the secondary result of inflammatory diseases mostly we have to understand the Crohn's disease in this case. The aseology and the pathogenesis the rectal fistulas occur mostly on the basis of acute periproctitis. The reasons of chronic fistulas are the opening of purulent periproctitis, periproctitis without cutting off the crypt, shortening of external anal sphincter at which fistulous channel is pressed and the excretion of its content stops the decreased resistance to infection and low tissue regeneration and the epithelialization of the coccygeal channels. This is another possible but rare condition which might lead to the development of anal fistula. The classification by the etiology and pathogenesis we classify them into initiate and acquired. Speaking about the acquired, this might be the traumatic, inflammatory or the tumoral. Position 2. By the character of infection, this might be either vulgaric or the anaerobic infection, or the specific such as tuberculosis, syphilis, or so and so on and so forth. By the anatomical size, depending on connection with the intestinal lumen, it might be either complete, incomplete, internal or external. By correlation to external sphincter, it might be either intrasphincteric, extrasphincteric and transphincteric. Depending on the primary localization of the inflammatory process, it might be subcutaneous, submucosal, ischiorectal and paleorectal. Depending on localization on external and internal fistulous channels, this might be the cutaneous, marginal or on the level of crypt. And by its shape, it might be either direct, complex, curved and containing cavities. On this picture you can see the several kinds of fistulas, anal fistulas, if we can classify them concerning to the anal sphincters. So position A, superficial fistula. Actually this one is the lightest on its duration. The sphincter is not involved in this case and this one has the best prognosis. The intrasphincteric fistula, position B. So it goes between the two sphincters. The transphincteric goes along the both of the sphincters. This is the most typical kind of anal fistula. The suprasphincteric, when it's localized upper the margin, the level of sphincters, and the extrasphincteric, which is localized somewhere upper inside in the rectum, this is mostly the result of the Crohn's disease and other inflammatory, inflammatory diseases of rectum. There are four degrees of extrasphincteric fistulas. The first degree there are no scar or inflammatory changes. The second degree is the scar process around the inner fistulous opening without inflammatory changes in the pararectal cellular tissue. The third degree, the purulent cavities or the infiltrates in the pararectal cellular tissue without scars around the inner opening. And the fourth degree, the incredible infiltrates or purulent cavities 
in pararectal cellular tissue and big scar process around the inner opening. The symptoms. It's not that painful usually. The body temperature is most in most of the cases is normal and it might grow only in case of the obturation of the fistula channel when the pus is collected inside. But when the pus is released, the pain, both the pain and the body temperature become no the pain goes down and the body temperature becomes normal. In most of the cases, the fistula, as I mentioned before, is the result of the previous acute paraproctitis. This is why the other name for the rectal fistula is called the chronic paraproctitis. You can see the external opening of the fistula. So this is actually the result. The reason is somewhere here inside in the defect of the mucose in this ruptured crypt. Somewhere here goes the fistula channel which is opening outside of the anal in the very anal area. So this is an external opening of the fistula. The diagnostic program, anamnesis and physical data, examination of anal area and anal channel, finger examination of rectum. You can always, almost always, you can palpate the fistula channel. The rectal mirror investigation to define the internal opening of the fistula, the rectoscopy, the general blood analysis, the general urine test, biochemical blood analysis, sedimentation, reactions. In some cases you might use the contrast fistulography and during the operation you might use the introduction of catheter into the fistula channel. There are several kinds of uh, surgical treatment of fistula. Actually there are dozens of those and depending on the kind of fistula, on the localization and on the degrees of complication. But anyway, the fistula is an indication for the urgent surgical for the planned surgical treatment. It cannot be removed using different kinds of pills and medications. There were some attempts to use some minimally invasive methods uh, which did not give the needed result and due to the high rate of recurrences, actually nowadays, the golden standard for the treatment of the rectal fissures, fistulas is still the surgery. You can see the initial stage of the surgery introducing the catheter from the external opening all over the fistular channel to the internal opening. The next stage will be cutting off the skin and removing the fistular channel which is actually uh, in this case it's already turned into a scar tissue and it contains the infection inside. So without doing this procedure you cannot heal your patient. Another, another part of the surgery is applying of the contrast into the external opening of the fistula. We use this method in case if the the fistular channel is not direct, is not straight, but it's curved and it might contain some purulent cavities. So we use this contrast to color the, the area which is needed to be removed. Another picture of the introduction of catheter. This was the case of the transphincteric perianal pararectal fistula. Another ancient method of treatment of fistula is the ligation method, which was invented actually by the Hippocrates, an ancient Greek scientist. So during this method, you, we put some ligage, we actually ligate the sphincter, the anal sphincter, through the channel of fistula. We use this method mostly for the extra sphincteric fistulas not to cut the sphincter, not to damage it. So, using this ligation, we can actually remove slowly but surely remove the fistular channel from the rectum outside. So it would remain on the ligature, 
and all the previous parts of rectum will heal by the scar tissue. <coughs> and this is the end for today. The inflammation as any the signs of inflammation of any other organ. Tumor, redness, high body temperature, severe pain and the violation of function. The etiology. It always has an infectious factor on its development, so usually there is a special defect in the anal channel. Usually this is a defect of the anal crypt, or in some rare cases this might be the result of the anal fissure, for example, or the other diseases, chronic inflammatory diseases such as Crohn's disease or the ulcerative colitis. So in this case, when the rupture of mucose of the anal channel appears, the infection gets from the feces, which are always infected, to the perirectal fat tissue. It becomes inflamed, the inflammation turns to the fuse. This disease is very painful, it has a very bright clinic. Usually the patients do not remain at home more than one or two days after the onset of the uh, disease. It always has a sharp, acute onset with a bright clinic and most of these patients come to the hospital in time because the pain causes great sufferings for the patients. Besides, the high body temperature is also accompanied, is also accompanying this disease. The high body temperature is 37.5 up to 39 degrees centigrade. Morphologically, there is defined purulent inflammation of crypts with further spreading of uh, to perirectal, ischiorectal, and pelvis cellular tissue. Purulent inflammation usually is as flag bone or rarely as an abscess. During, due to the localization of the abscess, you can define several kinds of periproctitis, the intrasphincteric abscess located between the uh, tissues of internal and external sphincters, the ischiorectal abscess, the most ty typical kind of uh, periproctitis, the perianal abscess, and the one which is not pictured here, the pelvioorectal abscess, which is located in the upper parts, upper sides of the rectum. So by the etiology we define usual, anaerobic, like gangrenous, uh, or anaerobic lymphangi lymphangiitis, the sepsis. Then the specifics such as tuberculosis or the syphilitic periproctitis and the post-traumatic periproctitis. By the localization we define the submucosal, subcutaneous, ischiorectal, pelvioorectal and retrorectal periproctitis. Separately, there is we define the secondary periproctitis, which actually is the in, uh, result of the inflammatory process of some other origin, and it might spread to perirectal cellular tissue from prostate gland, for example, or from female genitals. Now the other picture more exact picture, so here we can, you can notice once again the intersphincteric periproctitis, the intersphincteric abscess, the perianal subskin subcutaneous abscess, the high intermuscular abscess, the ischiorectal, the most typical, and close by its clinic the retrorectal, which would be located on the posterior wall, behind the posterior wall of Rectum. Now the submucosal, when the fuse is located just under the mucose layer of the rectum and the pelvioorectal, the pelvic pelvic rectal abscess. The periproctitis has both local and general symptoms. The most often, this is pain in anal region or in the area of rectum, the swelling, the hyperemia the fluctuation, the constipation, 
in some cases even the dysuria, the disturbances of the urination, the increase of body temperature and of course the loss of appetite and workability. During the general blood, ana blood analysis we will notice the leukocytosis with the left shift ESR increased and different other conditions which are less import important in this case. Another picture of acute periproctitis, so as I mentioned before, you see the anus here. Probably the reason of periproctitis was somewhere here in this area. This was a defect, the rupture of anal crypt and the infection from the feces got through the through this anal crypt, rupture of anal crypt to the periorectal fat tissue and caused a severe inflammation. So you can see the swelling, the swelling area with the hyperemia of this area, the redness. If you would palpate it, the patient would feel a strong pain. His body temperature would be about 38 degree and degrees centigrade and more and of course the loss of function because the now speaking about the main function here is the defecation, so it would be really painful. Another severe complication of, of periproctitis, periproctitis itself is called the anaerobic periproctitis and this exact case is the fle Fournier phlegmon. The Fournier is an ancient, is an old French scientist, French surgeon who discovered this disease so you can see the spreading of the inflammation to the scrotum and to the neighboring tissues. It is very dangerous and it is very hard to be treated. The periproctitis always demands the surgical treatment, actually the urgent surgical treatment after the small, the, the little and short preoperative prevention. So first the collection of anamnesis and physical data if we speak about the diagnostic program. The examination of anal area and anal channel. The finger examination. The finger examination is always painful. We do not usually use the rectal mirror investigation or the rectoscopy due to the pain. Some additional methods like x-ray examination of the ischial areas the bacteriogram after the surgery, after we, we release the, pu the pus, and usual blood and urine tests such as general blood count and general urine test, the biochemical blood analysis, coagulogram and the sedimental reactions. The differential diagnosis. Usually we do the differential diagnosis with acute hemorrhoids or the hemorrhoids complicated by the thrombosis. This Similar is the pain present in both diseases, but the difference is that the, usually in case of hemorrhoid, the body temperature is normal and the pain is lighter than if we speak about the acute periproctitis. The anal fissure. The swelling is slight, not that obvious as in case of the acute periproctitis, once again the body temperature is normal, though the pain is present and it becomes hotter and stronger after the defecation. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, the tactics of treatment is always the surgical treatment. Now the main thing, the, the main strategy in this case is divided into two parts. First of all, to release the pus, so to do the incision and release the pus, Thus, we remove the result, but to remove the main reason of the disease, we have to remove the anal crypt. So, this structured anal crypt, which led to the, the, to the spreading of infection from the lumen of rectum, from the feces, to the parietal cellular tissue. So, here you can notice, once again, the patient with an anaerobic periproctitis and we had to, this is a patient from our hospital, we had to do the several incisions to release the pus and in this area there was another incision to remove the anal crypt which caused the disease.
if this is very important to remove the anal crib because if you do not do this just to release the puce so the patient will definitely feel better there are some conditions when the puce is released on its own without any surgical assistance this happens when the patient remains at home for longer time like three to four to five days after the releasing of puce the patient feels way much better the pain goes away the body temperature becomes normal but if you do not remove the anal crypt the ruptured anal crypt which was the reason for this disease the patient will definitely have either the recurrence of the acute periproctitis in some closer future or the acute periproctitis will turn to the chronic periproctitis or the other name for that is rectal fistula rectal fistulas are the tubular pullerant channels in the cellular tissue surrounding the rectum and anus they're always the result of the previous untreated or treated incorrectly acute periproctitis or in some cases this might be the secondary result of inflammatory diseases mostly we have to understand the Crohn's disease in this case the osteology and the pathogenesis the rectal fistulas occur mostly on the basis of acute periproctitis the reasons of chronic fistulas are the opening of purulent periproctitis, periproctitis without cutting off the crypt, shortening of external anal sphincter at which fistulous channel is pressed and the excretion of its content stops, the decreased resistance to infection and low tissue regeneration and the epitalization of the coccygeal channels. This is another possible but rare condition which might lead to the development of anal fistula. The classification by the etiology and pathogenesis, we classify them into initiate and acquired. Speaking about the acquired, this might be the traumatic, inflammatory, or the tumoral. Position two, by the character of infection, this might be either vulgaric or the anaerobic infection, or the specific such as tuberculosis, syphilis, or so and so on and so forth by the anatomical size depending on connection with the intestinal lumen it might be either complete incomplete internal or external by correlation to external sphincter it might be either intrasphincteric extrasphincteric and transphincteric depending on the primary localization of the inflammatory process it might be subcutaneous, submucosal, ischiorectal, and paleorectal. Depending on localization on external and internal fistulous channels, this might be the cutaneous, marginal, or on the level of crypt. And by its shape, it might be either direct, complex, curved, and containing cavities. On this picture, you can see the several kinds of fistulas anal fistulas if we can classify them concerning to the anal sphincters so position a superficial fistula actually this one is the lightest on its duration the sphincter is not involved in this case and this one has the best prognosis the intrasphincteric fistula position b So it goes between the two sphincters, the transphincteric goes along the both of the sphincters. This is the most typical kind of anal fistula. The suprasphincteric, when it's localized up or the margin, the level of sphincters, and the extrasphincteric, which is localized somewhere upper inside in the rectum. This is mostly the result of the Crohn's disease and other inflammatory, inflammatory diseases of rectum. There are four degrees of extrasphincteric fistulas. The first degree, there are no scar or inflammatory changes. The second degree is the scar process around the 
inner fistulas opening without inflammatory changes in the pararectal cellular tissue. The third degree, the purulent cavities or the infiltrates in the pararectal cellular tissue without scars around the inner opening. And the fourth degree, the incredible infiltrates or purulent cavities in pararectal cellular tissue and big scar process around the inner opening. The symptoms. It's not that painful usually. The body temperature is most in most of the cases is normal and it might grow only in case of the obturation of the fistula channel when the pus is collected inside. But when the pus is released, the pain, both the pain and the body temperature become no the pain goes down and the body temperature becomes normal. In most of the cases, the fistula, as I mentioned before, is the result of the previous acute paraproctitis. This is why the other name for the rectal fistula is called the chronic paraproctitis. You can see the external opening of the fistula. So this is actually the result. The reason is somewhere here inside in the defect of the mucose in the structured crypt. Somewhere here goes the fistula channel, which is opening outside of the anal, in the very anal area. So this is an external opening of the fistula. The diagnostic program. Anamnesis and physical data. Examination of anal area and anal channel. Finger examination of rectum. You can always, almost always, you can palpate the fistula or channel. The rectal mirror investigation to define the internal opening of the fistula the rectoscopy, the general blood analysis, the general urine test, biochemical blood analysis, sedimentation, reactions. In some cases you might use the contrast fistulography and during the operation you might use the introduction of catheter into the fistulous channel. There are several kinds of uh, surgical treatment of fistula. Actually, there are dozens of those and depending on the kind of fistula, on the localization and on the degrees of complication. But anyway, the fistula is an indication for the urgent surgical, for the planned surgical treatment. It cannot be removed using different kinds of pills and medications. There were some attempts to use some minimally invasive methods uh, which did not give the needed result and due to the high rate of recurrences actually nowadays the golden standard for the treatment of the rectal fissures fistulas is still the surgery you can see the initial stage of the surgery introducing the catheter from the external opening all over the fistular channel to the internal opening the next stage will be cutting off the skin and removing the fistula channel, which is actually, uh, in this case, is already turned into a scar tissue and it contains the infection inside. So without doing this procedure, you cannot heal your patient. Another, another part of the surgery is applying of the contrast into the external opening of the fistula. We use this method in case if the fistular channel is not direct, is not straight, but it's curved and it might contain some purulent cavities. So we use this contrast to color the, the area which is needed to be removed. Another picture of the introduction of catheter. This was the case of the transphincteric perianal pararectal fistula. Another ancient method of treatment of fistula is the ligation method, which was invented actually by the Hippocrates, an ancient Greek scientist. So during this method you we put some ligature we actually ligate the sphincter, the anal sphincter, through the channel of fistula. We use this method mostly 
for the extra sphincteric fistulas not to cut the sphincter, not to damage it. So using this ligation we can actually remove slowly but surely remove the fistular channel from the rectum outside so it would remain on the ligature and all the previous parts of rectum will heal by the scar tissue. <coughs> and this is the end for today. Thank you for your attention.